As you know, Code Geass is technically not a romance anime, and despite the endless debates over which ship with Lelouch is best, by the way, it's obviously C2 and Lelouch, in the original series there were only two official couples, Valetta and Ogi, and the topic of today's video, Suzaku and Euphemia. In theory, a woman from the Britannia royal family, falling in love with a lower class Japanese man, albeit the son of the late Prime Minister Genbu Katarugi, is unlikely. Not only do you have the differences of classes here, but Britannia goes out of its way to discriminate against the Elevens. It's almost Shakespearean. I say Shakespearean because one of Shakespeare's famous plays is called Romeo and Juliet, with a plot revolving around two people from different feuding families that fall in love. Also, before I continue, huge spoilers for Code Geass and of course this play. Anyways, what was I saying? Right, Romeo and Juliet. So, this romance ends in tragedy. Juliet fakes her death, and unfortunately the messenger never reached Romeo in time, so he believed she was dead and therefore drank poison. When Juliet awakens to find her lover dead, she stabs herself, thus ending the romance between these two people. Given how Kogias references different Shakespearean works, this is obviously not an accident. What's amazing about this couple is that Suzaku and Euphemia, people from two different worlds, both found something in each other they weren't able to get by simply staying within their own boundaries. And that's why this is much deeper than most gave it credit for. I've often wondered if that's due to the general hatred for Suzaku and even Yuffie to some extent. But that doesn't matter when analyzing this relationship. I divide the video into two parts. Part 1 focuses on the narrative retelling of this romance, and part 2 is my analysis of the relationship. Since I built my analysis from the narrative retelling of this romance, I recommend watching the video in that order. All our tasks at hand have been cleared. Let's begin. Suzaku first encountered Euphemia in stage 5. He was just acquitted of his charges for killing Clovis, and on his way out, Euphemia just happens to be escaping out of the window. She also falls on him during her escape, and in the corniest way possible, you could call this love at first sight. When asked why Euphemia fell out of the window, she explained that someone was chasing her. We are then treated to a montage of Euphemia and Suzaku hanging out and having a good time. Suzaku figures out that Euphemia wasn't being chased by anyone, but never learns the truth until later on in the episode. From what I could tell, it was Euphemia's last day before assuming the role of the sub-viceroy under her sister, Cornelia. She knew her days of freedom were over, especially with her identity soon to be revealed to the public. This was her last chance to play the role of a civilian, and who better than Suzaku to show her around? This part might appear a simple filler, when in reality, it isn't. On previous viewings, something became clear to me. Euphemia acted like a different person when around Suzaku. She goofs around, talks to cats, and is very carefree. This is completely the opposite of how she acts around Cornelia, in which she appears to be very uncomfortable. Even at one scene where they have a laugh together, she still doesn't really feel like herself. Lelouch and Nunnally are the only ones besides Suzaku where Euphemia also acts in the same manner. Keep that in mind for later on in the video. Before the day ends, Euphemia requests to go to one more place, the Shikino Ghetto. The episode used this part to show Euphemia Suzaku's situation. Euphemia witnessed the combined frustrations of both the Japanese and the Britannians when people from both sides attacked Suzaku Kudarugi. The Japanese viewed Suzaku as a traitor, and the Britannians seemed as a useless honorary Britannian. The episode then shifts to a part where both C2 and Euphemia ask Lelouch and Suzaku in two separate conversations similar questions, and we see Suzaku and Lelouch answer these questions. Unlike Lelouch, Suzaku has no answers on how to solve the problem, just that he must keep going so no one else like his father has to die. Euphemia would later convey this same idea back to Suzaku once the fighting stopped due to her using her status as a Britannian royal princess. Euphemia and Suzaku would join forces to ensure that people like Clovis, Euphemia's brother, and Gembu, Suzaku's father, wouldn't have to die. From this moment, a friendship formed between the two. Until stage 11, these characters didn't share any on-screen dialogue. In stage 6, Suzaku hinted that Euphemia arranged for him to attend Ashford Academy. In stage 9, Yuffie wondered what Suzaku's thoughts were on everything that's going on currently. During stage 10, Euphemia joined Cornelia on the G1 base during the Narita operation to see combat firsthand. Due to an unforeseen human-induced landslide, Cornelia's forces were decimated. If it wasn't for Euphemia's actions in sending in Suzaku, Cornelia would have died. Lelouch said in stage 8 that Euphemia would sacrifice herself for the commoners. In stage 6, during Charles' speech, Euphemia's expression clearly indicated that she disagreed with her father's philosophy, and in stage 7, expressed that while she understood the theory of those who risked their lives on a battlefield are the ones who deserve to rule, she clearly disagreed with it. Yes, I said that out of order, and more importantly, why bring this up? Because this explains why Euphemia was willing to send out Suzaku to save Cornelia when everyone 
everyone else focused on Sadako's intentions and loyalty. This, by the way, happened several times in the story. There's more to this, but we'll get to that later. Oh, and a side note, Cornelia never thanked Yuffie for saving her life. After the events of Narita, we would then need to wait until stage 18 for Saku and Euphemia to interact again, and this time, we wouldn't have to wait too much longer after that episode for the next interaction, since they interact in every episode following stage 18. Stage 18 starts with Suzaku's ceremony to become Euphemia's knight. Euphemia chose him after he fought off the Black Knights and the Four Holy Swords in the previous episode. The other motivation behind this was helping Suzaku achieve his goals. Plus, in general, Suzaku has already proven his worth as a Nightmare Frame pilot, and if he wasn't Japanese, he would have already been made a Knight of Honor a long time ago. And then there's the hilarious sad reason stated by the noble that, quote, Euphemia has needs. Later on in that episode, Euphemia, Suzaku, along with other Britannian forces, head to Shigan an island, where again, Suzaku's loyalty is put into question by soldiers when Yuffima calls them to battle to fight against the Black Knights. The conflict ends with Velouche using his command on Suzaku to live, which eventually causes a whole commotion. Then, V2 transports Lelouch, Suzaku, Euphemia, and Colin to Kamen Island. During stage 19, Suzaku was with Colin at one area of the island, and Euphemia was with Lelouch in another area. It's thanks to both groups headed over to the search party that reunites our couple. And it was during that episode's conclusion that the remnants from the old Japanese and Administration returned to Japan in hopes to use Zero's chaos to reconquer Japan. Before they were teleported to Kamina Island, the Lucia's command to force Suzaku to live drove him to disobey his orders. Suzaku was arrested, but later cleared due to Schneizel's assistance. Still, Suzaku felt guilty over what happened, declaring to Euphemia he would no longer be her knight. After this conversation, it then shows Euphemia by herself declaring that she doesn't deserve this either. Despite his recent failure, the Britannians still use Suzaku to fight the invading forces. While all this takes place, Nina tries to enter the art museum, knowing that Yuffie is inside. She is instead brutally arrested, and once again has to be saved by Yuffie. The two would then take part in a conversation that changed Yuffie's life forever. I'm aware that everyone hates Nina Einstein, but if you like this couple, then you have to recognize that she's one of the reasons why it happened. Euphemia explained to Nina that she's not a good person, when compared to her siblings, but Nina tells Euphemia this isn't true, and gives her divine attributes while degrading herself in the process. She makes it clear that she needs needs Euphemia's goodness. Euphemia came to the realization that Zaku must hate himself in the same way, so she wanted to tell Zaku not to hate himself like Nina told her not to hate herself. So she rushed to Schneisel, got a private line, and ordered Zaku to love her, stating all the reasons why she loves him, and ending with the important part which Zaku shouldn't hate himself. Zaku also points out during that conversation, all of her actions were impulsive in a very adorable romantic scene that, as Cecile pointed out, was a private moment. Zaku ended the call of his last words, thinking he was going to die. It is thanks to Lelouch that that didn't happen. At the end of this episode, with the Chinese Federation forces defeated, Suzaku and Euphemia shared a tender moment together. Euphemia finally understood that her real motivations was to make people smile again for those she loved, and Suzaku agreed to help her, becoming her knight again and her boyfriend in the process. In the story, this was the pinnacle of their relationship, as they both have accepted their love for one another. During Stage 21 School Festival, Suzaku rescued Euphemia when a mob of people tried to approach her. She ends the episode with a pipe bomb, the announcement of the Special Administrative Zone of Japan, an area where Elevens will be treated as Japanese. And the only reason why this plan was taken seriously by the Japanese was due to Suzaku's support. Much like the audience, everyone in the show eagerly awaited Zero's arrival. Once he does arrive, Zero requested a private audience with Euphemia, and it seemingly was going well. Euphemia convinced Lelouch to work with her, and even gave up her line of succession to do so. Unfortunately, Lelouch's accent, his joke, or however you want to frame it, led to the massacre of the Japanese people. Lelouch was left with no other option than to kill Euphemia and take advantage of the chaos created by the command to form the United States of Japan. During the declaration of the new nation of Japan, Suzaku, who got to Yuffie too late, stays with her during her final moments. Suzaku couldn't understand why Euphemia would kill the Japanese. Since people under Gias have no memory of the command, Yuffie herself has no idea what happened. In confusion and sadness, Suzaku lied to Euphemia that everything worked out well to comfort her so she would die with no regrets and believing she did some good. No matter how many times I watch this scene, it always emotionally impacts me. I'm not sure if it's because I really want this couple to succeed, Michelle Ruff's acting, or both. One particular line that always gets me is when Euphemia tells Suzaku, Keep going to school. I have to stop before I, before I have the chance to finish. 
And Lair tells Izaku, You have to do it. For me. Okay? Yuffie first met Izaku after she left high school to become the Sub-Viceroy. And one of her final thoughts was how she never finished high school. It reinforces the idea that Yuffie wanted to have a normal life. That's probably another reason she gave up her claim to the throne and hid her identity from Suzaku when they first met. Her death always affected me, no matter how many times I watched it. A devastating loss for Suzaku, the man who lost the only person in the world who truly understood him. And it was a devastating loss in and of itself, as Yuffima just wanted people to live together, be happy, and just be a normal person, and she never got to see either of those dreams come into reality. Now that I've gone over the entire story of Suzaku and Euphemia's romance, let's now shift to the analysis part of this video where I discuss why this couple was so special. Part of me is doing this to quiet the naysayers, and the others because I really want to talk about it. I love this couple, it's one of my favorites in the series. Throughout the synopsis, I left several hints as to why this couple was so special, and now we're going to expand on those ideas. During my video in which I analyzed the relationship between Shirley Finette and Lelouch Lamperou slash Lelouch V. Britannia, I discussed how one of the keys of a good, solid relationship is when both members focus on what they give in the relationship versus what they take. Suzaku wanted to rise in ranks, which would give him the authority and ability to make change from within. And Euphemia wanted to help the commoners, in this case the Japanese people. She wanted people in general to stop fighting and instead smile with their loved ones. With this in mind, Suzaku helps Euphemia by becoming her knight and supporting the special administrative zone of Japan. And Euphemia helps Suzaku by promoting him as her knight and sending him into battle, and generally defended him against all the naysayers. But it goes much further than just an equal value exchange. Euphemia understood Suzaku in a way that no one else did, and Suzaku had so much guilt for killing his father. This guilt led to his desire to die in combat, and that he deserves nothing good in his life. In comes Euphemia, the only one who tells Suzaku that he shouldn't hate himself. She willingly takes on part of this burden with him, having also suffered the loss of a loved one. And this is why I brought the parts from stage 5 and stage 20 earlier. Euphemia learned about Suzaku's inner struggles and immediately wanted to help him. Euphemia might not be the strongest in the logical and mathematical intelligence department, but she does have excellent interpersonal intelligence. Remember, she defeated Lelouch by taking advantage of the fact that he did everything for Nunnally. So by protecting Nunnally, Lelouch would have to work with her. Now obviously she did this with good intentions, but still, she took advantage of his motivations. Even though Euphemia is dead by the end of R1, her impact on the story lives on. Suzaku throughout R2 is a broken man. Gino comments on how he never smiles, and when questioned by Anya, Suzaku explained, point in trying to make people understand why I'm doing all these things. Because there was someone who did understand. Which points out that not only was Yuffie the only one to really understand him, but it also gave Suzaku a reason for living, something he didn't have before. There's a reason why he hated and wanted to kill Lelouch slash Zero, which was completely justified. A common question that people ask is, why would Suzaku join Lelouch if he killed Euphemia? Well, he did it because Lelouch promised to cause so much damage that people would forget about Princess Massacre. It is also reasonable to assume that since Lelouch knew that Suzaku wanted to kill him, making that part of the Zero Requiem probably sweetened the deal. Okay, so I've explained how Euphemia was a strong rock to Suzaku, but what did Suzaku do for Euphemia? Well, the biggest is probably that he supported her goals, but it's way more complex than the simple naive plan I mentioned earlier. On my most recent watch of R1, where I discussed each episode during the various live streams, I noticed something about Euphemia. This might be a reach or a stretch depending how you look at it, but during her conversation with Nina, I got the impression that Euphemia was mentally abused sometime after Charles exiled Lelouch and Nunnally to Japan, and I think the people that mentally abused her were. Cornelia and Schneisel. Euphemia told Nina that when compared to her siblings, she's not special at all. We also hear her inner thoughts of self-loathing. I have seen other cases in real life where victims of abuse idolize their abusers. In order to preserve the good opinion of your parent, you have to blame yourself. And so you think, if only I hadn't have said that, if I hadn't have asked for strawberry jam instead of apricot jam, you know, if, if I was thinner, 
if I was if I was X Y Z, you know, just substitute whatever it is that it is for for each individual person. But just you know, if I could just make myself better and less and and smaller and less needy and less burdensome, if only I could just bend myself more into this emotional pretzel. And so you blame yourself, and and so what happens is over time that gets internalized as I am faulty. Like there is something at my core that is faulty. Because it's obviously my fault. If what Leia Walter sounds familiar, that's because it perfectly describes Euphemia. All you have to do is listen to what Euphemia says while in the art museum. A figurehead. That's all I was from the start. I knew that. But I thought if I gave my best effort, maybe I could make some difference. Give me Clovis. I met Zero face to face, but I didn't avenge your death. I don't have the kind of power that my sister has. I'm not like her or Schneisel. No matter where I go, I'm just a burden. And I act selfishly, though I don't mean to. I chose my knight against my sister's advice. And now he's resigned. Euphemia understood her role as a figurehead, but hoped to prove she could be more useful beyond that. Euphemia hates herself because based on her inability to be like her siblings, she feels like a burden. She labeled choosing Suzaku as her knight as both a selfish act and a form of betrayal to Cornelia. By not killing Zero, she couldn't avenge Clovis's death. Because Suzaku resigned as her knight, it only made things worse. To put it simply, Euphemia ignores her wonderful attributes because she can't be like her siblings. She looks up to them as something to strive for and focus the issues on her instead of her siblings when she failed, which is common among abuse victims. This is the first sign that I thought that she had an abusive childhood. There are other examples in the story besides this episode that we can draw more examples of this abusive past. Let's go through a couple. No one takes Euphemia seriously in the story outside of low-level soldiers. The media mocks her, Cornelia treats her like a child, and Schneisel pretends to care. And yes, there are scenes where Cornelia is kind to Euphemia, but it always felt off to me. It seemed like Cornelia was talking to Euphie as a parent and not as a sibling. We also know from the conversation with Lelouch on Kamina Island that Cornelia doesn't listen to her at all, meaning she's fine with giving Euphie instructions, but has no interest in her actual perspective on things. Which makes sense, since every time Euphie does act on her own, like when she made Suzaku her knight, or announcing the special administrative zone of Japan, Cornelia pulled rank on her or expressed anger. I can only wonder what their childhood was like. I don't deny that Cornelia cared about Euphemia, but that doesn't justify her treatment towards her. And Schneizo, you can argue, was even worse, because he simply used her ideology to benefit his own agenda while lying about his intentions in the process. We saw this when he told Yuffie to follow her dreams with the Special Administrative Zone of Japan. When he spoke to Cornelia, he only mentioned the strategic benefit to it, and previously he politely told Euphemia to leave when she offered help during the invasion of the Chinese Federation troops. And if you want to go further, he almost killed her in stage 18 during the bombing of the Shigana Island. The soldiers pointed out that even though Yuffie went after Suzaku, they would still continue the bombardment. It does confuse me why Yuffie never asked Schneisel about this later on. While Schneisel admittedly did change after getting the Flea, we can derive that his mindset of sacrificing Nunnally for Zero was being applied in this case as well, except replace Nunnally for Yuffie. Okay, so I just briefly mentioned mental abuse into a conversation that could be its own subject, which I'm sure no one asked for. So why bring this up? Because it's a strong contrast between how Suzaku treats Euphemia in the story. As in, he didn't do this to her at all. He believed in her mission when creating the Special Administrative Zone of Japan. Heck, he supported it, shared serious conversations with her about his future plans, and wanted to work with her in general to building a better future. Suzaku never talks down to Yuffie and genuinely respects her. He even shared dark secrets and showed her trust, the same trust her siblings never afforded her. I also felt that Euphemia never hesitated when discussing her ideas with Suzaku. She often expressed those ideas in a more more mature and confident tone. When she talks to Cornelia, it appears that Euphemia is uncomfortable in expressing herself. This is why it always comes across more like a child talking to a parent than siblings, as I mentioned earlier. Oh, and as a side note, Schneisel used Euphemia's name to encourage and manipulate Nina to work on the Flea Warheads, which again proves how much Schneisel really cared about Euphemia if he was willing to use her name for something this evil. But getting back to why Suzaku treating Euphemia was really good in comparison to her siblings, for someone like Yuffie, how Suzaku treated her was all she ever wanted. She's not just some childish member of the royal family who could only serve as a figurehead like Clovis. Yuffie is better at relating to others than both of her siblings combined. And I don't know if that was Cornelia's motivation for eventually making her Viceroy of Area 11, but I highly doubt it. Cornelia saw being in Area 11 as a nuisance and wanted to leave ASAP work on more important things, not taking into account what Yuffie actually wanted. If we have learned anything from Clovis, Kolaris, and Nunnally, the Empire doesn't take the leadership of Area 11 too seriously. No offense to Nunnally, 
Ali, but fudge the other guys. On a much lighter note, while with Sasagu, Yefima could just be herself. We saw that in stage 5, and it's really sad because she never got to really act that way ever again, which makes her death even more tragic when you think about it. Ko Gias, the Luch of the Rebellion R1, succeeded in creating a believable romance between Suzaku and Euphemia. It's especially impressive when you realize that Ko Gias isn't even a romance story to begin with. Each one completed the other, being the rock for them in their worst moments. If it weren't for their bond, Suzaku would have never climbed the ranks, and Euphemia wouldn't have been able to create the flawed, but an idea of good intentions, the special ministry zone of Japan. These two are a great example of what makes a strong, romantic relationship. For closing thoughts, I've always wondered what could have been? Would Suzaku and Yefim have gotten married? What does a post-special administrative zone of Japan look like with the Black Knights now disarmed? We have to look to fan fiction and fan theories to find our answers. I could go even further about Yefimia's death and its impact on the story in another video. But until then, we can simply reflect on what could have been a beautiful couple between soulmates from two different worlds. And with that, we have come to the end. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, let me know in the comments your thoughts on this romance. Join my email list and Discord server, and follow me on my socials, which will all be linked in the description below. And as I always say, the world is not a dark place, and tomorrow will be a good day. Thanks for watching.